as we begin a new series going through the book of Jonah, I just want you to stop and to imagine. Imagine if we've been raising uh, money for Ukraine and uh, we're very grateful for, uh, for all of the efforts <laughs> to raise money for this great event. And we know the great hardship that is currently happening. We know the, the geopolitical events that are occurring. Now imagine if President Zelensky, the, the president of Ukraine, went right into the heart of the Russian Federation, to the very capital city. Imagine if President Zelensky marched into Moscow with one message a message for all the people of Russia, a message for all the leaders of Russia, a message for the soldiers of Russia. Repent and turn away from what you are doing. I mean, can you imagine that news headline? Can you imagine what some of the Russians might do to the president of Ukraine if he had the audacity to march into Moscow? It's a really remarkable thing to think about. But as we come to the book of Jonah, this is exactly what God is asking Jonah to do. Jonah is asking a prophet of Israel to go to the Assyrian Empire, a violent, barbaric, horrible empire, right into the capital of it, in Nineveh, and to tell everyone to turn away from their evil, because in God there is forgiveness. It really is a remarkable and shocking opening scene to the book of Jonah. And some people will often say, I, I know all about Jonah. The book of Jonah is about a, it's all about a big fish. That's what the book of Jonah is about, isn't it? It's about a big fish. Well, friends, as we go through this book, I want to argue that the book of Jonah is not about a big fish. It's about a big God. That's really what the book of Jonah is about. One theologian says that the book of Jonah has five chapters. He's a great theologian. He's terrible at counting. Because we all know Jonah's got four chapters. But what this theologian argues is that Matthew chapter 12 and the verses that we read earlier almost act as a summary and we cannot understand the book of Jonah unless we understand Matthew 12. Matthew 12 and verse 41 says, The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. As we go through the entire series looking at the historic narrative of this prophet, what I want you to have in your minds and your hearts is simply this. Jonah is not the perfect prophet. Jonah, as we are going to see very quickly in the book of Jonah, makes mistakes. But there is a greater Jonah. As we think about the person of Jonah, I want us to think and reflect on the person of Jesus Christ who is bigger and greater. And it is him, it is Christ that we have come to worship. So my first point is that Jonah rejects the word of the Lord. Our story begins in verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah. The story of Jonah begins by God making his will known. I just want to stop there for a little bit because it is one of the greatest truths in the Bible that God has made his will and himself known. You see, the book doesn't begin with Jonah sitting there with his cleverest friends thinking, what does God want us to do? What would God have us to do? He's not sitting there thinking, who is God? And looking around him and trying to uh, put two and two together and trying to work it out. 
The book of Jonah begins by God revealing his plan and his purpose to Jonah. Our God is not a God who is distant or far away or quiet, but our God is a God who has made his will clear. Our God is a God who communicates to his people today. We are not lost wanderers, but we are a people who God has revealed himself to. It's precious. It's something to hold on to. In the Old Testament, God spoke to the prophets, and the prophets would go off, and they'd tell the people of Israel what God had said. In the New Testament, God largely spoke through the apostles, and the apostles would go off and tell people what God has said. The problem for us today is that we don't have prophets in the same way. We don't have apostles in the same way. So how is God to communicate with us? Well, we have a beautiful thing, don't we, in that we have the completed word of God. We have it in our hands, we have it on our laps, we have it on our phones, on our iPads, on the TV. We can have it read to us. The Bible is absolutely everywhere. If you don't have a Bible, come and see me. We've got loads in the church that we're happy to give away. The word of the Lord is everywhere. But I think the sad reality is that though the word of the Lord is everywhere, that does not mean that people listen or respond to what God has said. And I just want to make the point that if you do not know Jesus Christ this evening, you in the building, you watching online, if you do not know Jesus Christ today, then you are rejecting the word of the Lord. God has made his plan of salvation clear. You can read about it. You can talk to any number of Christians and they'll tell you the truth about Jesus. And yet so many people know the gospel, know the good news, but they're rejecting the word of the Lord. But Jonah begins by God making himself known. Verse 2 says, Arise. The word of the Lord has come to Jonah, and it says, Arise. Get up. I've got something for you to do. If I could bring this maybe into the... Uh, the modern day, I'll put it this way. Arise. Get up. Pick up your walking stick. Or your crutches, if you're the pastor. But pick up your walking stick. Pick up your crutches. There's a job to do. We are not called as Christians to just sit and mellow and relax and rejoice in God only. But there is a work and a task to do. And the word of the Lord came to Jonah and he says, arise. There is a task to do. There are people that don't know Jesus who need to hear about Jesus. And the challenge is for us as Christians, will we arise? Will we stand up and talk about him? Will we stand up and share the good news about Jesus or will we just sit and stay there because it's easier and, and I'm going to shy away and nobody will arise? The word of the Lord came to Jonah to say, get up and go. I have got a plan. And friends, I just want to ask, is it time that the church of Jesus Christ gets up, arises, and takes this gospel message to all the world? Because it, there is a great hope. However much energy you have, however much energy God has given you, whatever people God has put in your path, the question is, will you share? Will you stand up for your Saviour? And what we see here very quickly is God's word has come to Jonah and Jonah rejects it. He does not care what God is saying. He does not want to do it. Now, throughout my sermon, I want us to be thinking about the historic narrative of Jonah. 
But I also want us to be thinking about the greater Jonah. Friends, if I can put it this way, Jonah rejects the word of the Lord. But Jesus is the word of the Lord. Our Jesus is the word of God. If in the life of Jesus Christ, here we see the will of God perfectly executed. What is it that Jesus Christ cried out? Not my will be done, but thy will. What is it that Jesus Christ exemplifies? It is a life lived to the glory of God. Jesus Christ, who is God, he never disobeyed. He never ignored. He never put off what God had to say. Our hope and our confidence is not in our ability to get up and to go. It's not in our ability to get up and arise. But our hope is rested firmly in Jesus Christ. John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is our Saviour. This is our Jesus, who perfectly executed the will of God. The second thing we read, my second point, is Jonah, the son of Amittai. Now, if you were an ancient Jew reading this passage, verse 1 is a little bit boring, really. Because verse 1, what we have is God speaking to a prophet. That would be like beginning a book by saying a sailor got on a boat or a builder went to go build a house. It, of course God is talking to a prophet. That's what the prophets were there for. There's nothing that shocking about verse 1. Verse 2, however, to an ancient Jewish audience might be one of the most shocking parts of the Old Testament. Certainly one of the most shocking things that God has told a prophet. Verse 2 says, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come before me. I cannot think of another Old Testament prophet who was called. This is a prophet of Israel who has been called to go to a foreign nation. There's something incredibly special about this. Now, who is God going to send to a foreign nation? Jonah, the son of Amittai. Now, there's not much of a, uh, a background about Jonah. And I suspect, and many theologians suspect, this is because Jonah needed no introduction. Now, we all know those people. You don't even, you don't have to say anything about them. You just say their name and everyone knows what you mean. Their reputation precedes them. Everybody knows about them. Many theologians have said, well, maybe one of the reasons why there's not a great deal of information about Jonah is because Jonah would have been very well known. Jonah is mentioned in, uh, in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 14, and what we read about Jonah is that Jonah is very supportive of King Jeroboam's aggressive military policies. And uh, King Jeroboam was very, uh, during his reign, he wanted to grow Israel. He wanted to take land. And Jonah was incredibly supportive of this military campaign. Several of the other prophets uh, weren't as glowing in Jeroboam's actions. But Jonah was a patriot. He was a nationalist. He loved his people, and we can only presume his people loved him. He was somebody who was proud to be one of God's chosen people. Proud to be called as a prophet to God's chosen people. Now I think that God has got a a tremendous sense of humour. And I think we see it very clearly here. If you were to send somebody out to evangelise to a, a foreign nation, who would you choose? 
Well, you would choose somebody with a missionary heart, wouldn't you? Somebody that's got a great desire to see people from every tribe and tongue and nation come to Jesus. Here what we see is that God sends out Jonah. I don't think the ancient Jewish readers would have expected Jonah to want to go to a foreign country to tell them about God. And I don't think Jonah expected Jonah to be asked to go to a foreign country and tell them about God. Jonah was a prophet, and prophets took the word of God to God's chosen people. But here in the book of Jonah, God is saying, go out. The word that I have for you, the salvation that I have, is so great, it cannot be contained to one ethnic group. Go out. Go to Nineveh. Go to the wickedest and the vilest and tell them to repent. Tell them to turn away. And we know that Jonah knows that as he goes, he's expecting God to save and be compassionate. Jonah does not want to go. This patriotic, nationalist man who loves his people does not want to go to foreign, immoral, wicked people. And it's very easy to read this and think that Jonah is clearly wrong. I think that's the obvious reading of this, isn't it? That Jonah is clearly wrong to do what he's doing. But actually, I think we have to understand that Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria. And there's many secular historians that write about Assyria as being one of the most violent and dangerous nations that there have ever been on this planet. It was a violent, horrible culture. And so in one sense, Jonah's reaction is a normal, understandable reaction. These people do not deserve God's forgiveness. Now, I want you to imagine, when was it, or remember back, when was the last time that you held a newborn baby? Can you remember that uh, feeling of holding the newborn baby? That maybe nerves, because the parents are watching you and you're making sure to support the, the neck. And you look at that child and you're, you're hoping it's not sick on you. But you're holding that beautiful baby in your arms and you can see their, their arms and their, their tiny fingers and the fingernails that are even, even smaller. And there's a universal reaction that I've discovered when you hold a baby. No matter who you are, you hold a baby and you go, no. Oh. That's the universal reaction to holding a newborn child, isn't it? Well, the Assyrians' view was to hold the newborn child and throw it into a lit fire. These are the people that we are talking about. Jonah was called to go to God to people that regularly burnt men, women, and children. There's reports of it being for, for their God worship or, or maybe just in violence. This was a violent, disgusting people. And Jonah is not wanting to go. If there is a people that deserve God's anger and God's judgment, it is the Assyrians, vile and wicked. And yet the grace of God is so great. What can change a city like Nineveh? It is nothing but God. What can change our city? What can change Think, you know, North Korea and countries that oppress and murder Christians today. What can change them? It is nothing but the power of the gospel. And I think there's a great danger in jumping automatically to say, Jonah was wrong. But we have to understand that these Assyrians were violent. When we think about immorality that happens here today, we don't know the half of it. The Assyrians were vile and wicked and God says, arise Jonah and go to Nineveh. And God says to Jonah to call out against the city because their evil has come up before me. 
It's a great reminder here that, that God saw all the pain, all the wickedness, all the evil that was happening in Nineveh, none of it escaped God's attention. And God is going to deal with it. And the way that God chooses to deal with it is to bring salvation, to change these people so that they are not the same. Arise and go to Nineveh. But I think it's also a warning for us. God sees every evil that is done. Now, when you're thinking about the Assyrians and, and Nineveh, that's really easy. That's a great truth, isn't it? Yeah, God sees their evil. Or you can pick at a, a group of people, who, when you read in the newspapers the crimes that are happening, you think, God sees that. The judge of the universe sees the evil that they're doing. It's much harder when you think about your life, isn't it? That all my wrongs, all my sinful thoughts, God sees all of it. No sin, no mistake, no error will ever be missed by God. My God sees everything. Jesus knows all of our failures, all of our mistakes, and he welcomes all those who will turn to him in repentance and they will be saved. It's a glorious gospel truth. Now, Jonah did not want to go to this city because, as we read in, in Jonah chapter 4, Jonah knows God is going to be compassionate on them. I think it's a real challenge for us, isn't it? Jonah had perhaps ethnic and moral reasons why he did not want to take the message of God to those people. Do we sometimes, as the people of God, have similar prejudices? Do we have racial prejudices? I hope not. We've all sung tonight, haven't we? Every tribe, every tongue, every nation... That's who the gospel is for. Do we have moral hang-ups? Perhaps we think, I can't talk to them about Jesus. Have you heard the language? You think, I, I, I can't tell that person about Jesus. They've got more tattoos than they've got teeth. They wouldn't fit well in a middle-class church in Morriston, would they? Friends, the message that comes from God is for Jonah to go out out from his comfort zone, out from God's people, to take the message of salvation to people that are immoral and bad and different from you. And I don't think the gospel message has changed much, do you? That we should go out to people who are different from us. Friends, people who are immoral are sinners. And who did Jesus come for? Sinners. We heard about it this morning. I think one of the greatest examples of this, Jonah, the son of Amittai, but Jesus is the son of God. Jonah had a great care and concern for his own people, for his own kingdom. Jesus has got a great care and concern for God's kingdom. What we see in the person of Jesus, John 4 is, I think, one of the best examples of this. Our Jesus is the greater Jonah. Our Jesus goes to a, a foreign lady. The, the, the Jews and the Samaritans hated one another, didn't associate with one another. And Jesus goes to this Samaritan woman. Despite all of her sin, despite all of her baggage, what does Jesus offer her? Living water. Life. What does Jesus do he reveals to her the Christ. He reveals to her the Messiah. And from that encounter, the whole village is changed and transformed by Jesus Christ. Jonah does not want to go to these immoral people, but friends, we have a greater Jonah. Our Jesus, thankfully, <laughs> thankfully to you in this room, thankfully for me, 
He welcomes people that have made mistakes. He welcomes people that have failed in their lives. He welcomes people that have been rejecting him for years and years. He calls them to repentance and to come to him. This is our greater Jonah. And then my final point. You'll probably be able to guess where I'm going with this. But Jonah runs from the city. There's a great irony here, isn't there? That if you look at verse 2, God says to Jonah, Arise. And what does Jonah do in verse, in, uh, in verse 3? Well, he rises. He gets up. So God tells Jonah to arise and go here. Jonah says, I'm going to get up and I'm going to go this way. He was called to go to the east. He went to the west. He went as far away as he could possibly get. I think this is a really helpful reminder for us to think about. Even as Christians, we can live in a way that is contrary to how God would want us to live. Even as Christians, we can disobey God. This is a great example of a prophet who is disobeying God. Jonah is here to serve as a lesson and a reminder that even as followers of Jesus, we can fall into this trap and follow ourselves. Follow other people. Follow the crowd. Follow what's easier. Friends, I encourage you, follow Jesus. When it's hard, when it's tough, keep on living for him. Now here's a a question for you. Why does Jonah run away? The word of the Lord has come to Jonah, telling him to go out from what he's used to. Why does Jonah run away? Well, the Sunday school answer is, he's running away from where God is sending him. Jonah doesn't want to go to Nineveh, and so he runs away. Well, I don't think that's right. I don't think that's the full story. If Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh, Jonah could have just sat where he was. Have you ever thought about that? Jonah could have just sat where he was. He would still be disobeying God. He still wouldn't have to go to Nineveh. And it would have, cost, it would have saved him a lot of money and a lot of time. But there is something about what Jonah is doing that leads to him trying to get as far away as possible. And the reality is is that Jonah was not fleeing the, the command of God. Jonah was fleeing from God himself. This is crucial that we understand this as Christians. The problem with not following God, the problem with not living for God, is it is that... Sin will ultimately damage and hinder and impede our relationship with a holy God. Jonah was not running away from God's command. Verse 3 says, But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Because of Jonah's sinful disobedience, he doesn't just want to not go where God has sent him, He doesn't want to be in the presence of God. This man's a prophet. God speaks to the prophet. And scripture tells us that he fled the presence of God. He ran away from God himself. His relationship with God was not right because of his own sin. That's very deep for a Sunday evening, isn't it? Friends, repent. Whatever sins you have committed, whatever you have done wrong this week, go to Jesus and say sorry. Whatever your failure has been, don't run away from the Lord. Instead, run towards him and find forgiveness. Sometimes when we feel far away from God, 
It is because our habitual, regular sinning is damaging our relationship with God. And we need to know this as Christians. But we also need to know what the people of Nineveh came to know. That there is not a sin that you can commit that Jesus cannot forgive. Think about the atrocities that happened in Nineveh. And when they turned away from themselves and turned and looked to God, they found forgiveness. Friends, whatever sins you're struggling with, look to Jesus. Turn to him and be forgiven. Jonah runs away from the city. Let me end with this. Jesus goes towards the city. Jesus went to Jerusalem knowing what would happen. Knowing that as he walked towards Jerusalem, he would be crucified, nailed to a cross. Knowing that he would be beaten and tried. But more than that, knowing that on that cross he would bear the punishment the weight, the penalty, the debt of all that I've done wrong, Christ bore upon that cross. The debt has been paid. The penalty has been paid for all who turn to Jesus. Jesus knew what was awaiting him when he was walking towards Jerusalem. And yet, he sets his face and he goes anyway. Such obedience and faithfulness to the Father. Jesus Christ was obedient even to death on a cross. Jonah ran away. Jesus went towards that city. And just outside those walls, he was put to death. He bled and he died to save the people of Nineveh, to save the people from Samaria, to save Jew and Gentile, you and me. It is only the work of Jesus Christ that brings forgiveness and salvation. Friends, we have a greater Jonah. We have a greater prophet. A prophet who was obedient to the word of God, even to giving up his own life, that you may find life in him. Life for now. Life for for all of eternity. We have a greater Jonah. His name is Jesus. And he calls anyone and everyone to come to him this day. Amen.